we're going to find the multiplicative inverse of these two things, uh, these 7 and 9. What does it mean that something is the multiplicative inverse? If, it's the multipl if one number is the multiplicative inverse of the other, how do we know? times negative is positive, that's good. 3 times 4 will be 12, and 4 times 3 will be 12, and so we'll get 1. Okay. What's another number, or another name for this number? The reciprocal. Okay, so we're just talking about the reciprocal. Um, how would you define the reciprocal? If you saw a number, how would you know, to know what its reciprocal was? that number and do what with it? Danielle? Can you flip it right over? Okay. Well, here's kind of a problem with this one. Um, we can't really flip this over, right? What would be helpful in flipping this over? Yes, improper fraction. Good. So, um, it's negative 4 to 3rd. How many thirds does 4 have? How many thirds is 4 made of? John? 4. Huh? 4. It's 4 is made up of 4 thirds. So what I'm saying here is, here's, here's 1, and then, uh, oh no, that's not thirds. And that's, <coughs> uh, so here's thirds, here's 1, 2, 3, 4 thirds is just, this is 4, four thirds. But if we have four things, and we split them all into three, then how many thirds would that be in four? How many thirds does four have? They're all right there. How many are there? Four. Or a count the thirds. Here's one. So how many are there all together? Yeah? Four. There's twelve. Right, if we split four into three, each of these four into three pieces, then all together we have 12 of those pieces, those pieces being a third in size. Four is the same as 12 thirds, right? 12 divided by three is four. Okay, so that's one third. All right, we're really adding that to one third. Okay, so we have this negative, negative one. <coughs> What is this as an improper fraction? 13 thirds, yeah. Now, probably, if you put this into an improper fraction, you probably did 3 times 4 plus 1, right? You learned that. Uh, but I'll keep doing stuff like this until it's apparent that most of the class understands what's going on, not just how to do the shortcut, but what, what's going on. When I say how many thirds are in 4, uh, you should know, or if it's a confusing question, you should ask for clarification. You say, what do you mean by that? Okay. Uh, in four, we can see there's, there's 12 pieces uh, besides one third. And that's what we're doing when we do three times four plus one. We're just finding out how many thirds are in this many holes, and then adding on however many more we have. Right, so we have negative 13 thirds, so the multiplicative inverse is what? What? Negative 3 over 13, right? What is the number that when you multiply it by negative 13 over 3, you're going to get positive 1? Well, if we multiply this by its reciprocal, or its multiplicative inverse, then we'll get uh, 13 times 3 would be 39 over 39, and that would be 1. So our multiplicative inverse negative 3 over 13. Okay, find the quotient number 22, negative 1 third divided by 5 thirds. Okay, 
So we're dividing by a fraction, which is odd, but it'd be easier to view this as what? Danielle? Multiplication. Multiplication. You flip the, the, the denominator, second one, the one you're dividing by. Yeah? Negative one third times the reciprocal of the denominator or the, um, the divisor. Okay, so now we're multiplying together. We multiply by going straight across. But before we do that, if we want to save ourselves a little bit of time, what can we do? Danielle. Cross simplify, cross uh, cancel, whatever words you like to use. Three divided by three is just one. Okay, that saves time because what's going to happen over here is we're going to multiply all this stuff together. We're going to get this big number that consists of all of these factors smushed into the, this big multiple, and then we're going to have to look at these big numbers and try and factor them and figure out if they have factors in common. But if we start back here with smaller numbers, it's a, a lot easier job. So this will be negative. 1 over 5. Does anybody have a simplified form of this, this expression, this fraction? Any form at all, the simplified version, John? Negative <coughs> K plus K plus 5. Uh, okay, negative p, yeah, plus 2.5. Uh, yeah, sure. <coughs> Five. Does that work? Okay, answer here. The important thing here is that you don't do something like this and get negative p plus 15. Or, right, this is... This is no, well, we'll, we'll, we'll write something else here. Uh, or this, canceling 6 with 15 and calling it negative 6p plus, P plus uh, 5 over 2. This is a big no, we just neither of these. Okay. okay. The important thing to remember is that we have a quantity here. We can think of it as being in parentheses. It's grouped together uh, by virtue of the fact that it's in the numerator. The entire numerator is this expression. Okay, and we're dividing. And dividing and multiplication, they're all just two sides of the same coin. Dividing is really is multiplying by the reciprocal. Right? So if multiplication distributes across this addition, if you have to distribute multiplication, you also have to distribute Division. Division has to be applied to each term in the parentheses, in the numerator. Okay. So if we do one of these, we have it distributed. We just apply the division to one of the terms, either to the first one here or the second one here. Okay. That's no good. We haven't divided the numerator by the denominator. The numerator is the whole thing, all of it. And if you don't divide all of it by the denominator, then you haven't done the division you know, like all the way. But over here, John gives us the answer of negative p plus 2.5, which is an acceptable answer. There's several, well, I'll say at least two solid acceptable answers. Um, divide negative 6 by 6, you get negative 1p. Divide 15 by 6, you get 2.5. Right. The way we talked about in class was that uh, if we're going to cancel out this 6, or a factor of 6, from the denominator and the numerator, in the denominator and the numerator, and this is true of all fractions, if you're going to simplify a fraction or cross out uh, you know, a number, if you're going to simplify a fraction, then the numerator and denominator need to have what in common? Can we talk about? Multiples. Not multiples, over there, we're in the ballpark. Factors, we need a common factor. The factors are multiples, so <coughs> they're very closely related. Okay. So this works. Also, if we're going to cancel out a factor, then the numerator, the whole thing, all of it, the parentheses here, not just this and not just that, but both of them or all of them, however many terms there are, need to have that same factor in common. We need to be able to like, undistribute that factor from the numerator and the denominator if necessary. Okay. So in the denominator, we have uh, 
uh, we'll write it as three times two. We'll factor it all the way out, okay? And then we'll try and write uh, this, okay? So let's say, we'll just save ourselves a little bit of time. We'll go right to three, okay? So let's, we'll just cover this up for a second. If we're gonna cancel out a three from the denominator and the numerator, that means if there's any common factors, then the numerator and denominator need to have a factor of what? Danielle? What? Three. Three, yeah, we need to have it. You're gonna cancel out a three, that means that three is a factor, okay, of the numerator and the denominator. The numerator is, like we said, it's this whole thing. It's in these orange parentheses. If the numerator has a factor of three, then that means, this is the definition of a factor, that means that three times something else will give you the numerator. Following. Three is a factor of 15, because three times five is 15. Three is a factor of 30, because three times 10 is 30. Right? Is three a factor of this? If it is, then we need to be able to fill this in. Three times something. Right? Three times 10 would be 30. Three times five would be 15. Three times 100 would be 300. Three times something, whatever comes out of it, that three will be a, a factor of that. So can we fill in these parentheses? So that were we to m multiply this three in here to distribute this three, we would come up with negative six p plus fifteen. Can we fill in the parentheses? Can anybody fill in the parentheses with something that when we distribute the three, that's what we wind up with? Yeah. Just the number negative two. Plus. No. Nope. Plus. Plus five. Plus five. Okay. So now we're going to test it out by distributing the three. Right. So three times negative two? Negative six. That's close. <coughs> Do we want to get negative six? We're going to get negative six times p. So how do we fix that? Anybody? Put a p where? Next to the? Next to two. There we go. Now three times negative two p will be negative six p. Yeah, good. Three times five, 15. All right, did it work? Distributing, we're getting back what we need to get. Okay, so since three times this gives us the numerator, three times negative two p plus five gives us the numerator. Well, what does that mean about three? Three is a factor of, of what? Three is a factor of 15, true, but even bigger than that, in the context of this problem, three is a factor of, got the parentheses, signs going, factor of what? What's this called? Okay, the top of this fraction, the numerator, it's a factor of the numerator. Since we can type three times something, whatever that something is, and get the numerator, three is a factor of the numerator. So three is a factor of the numerator, three is a factor of the denominator. Three cancels with three. So here's another way to go. Negative two p plus five over two. Okay. This is good. This is a more common simplified form of that. When we deal with expressions, we'll usually leave them as one big fraction um, with a few exceptions. If we want to get this, we want to get what John had as his answer. We just need to do the same thing with 2 as, as he did with 6. You just divide everything by 2. If you divide this by 2, you get negative p. Divide 5 by 2, you get 2 and a half. Okay, a lot of words. I talked a lot and said a lot of words. Okay, were those words helpful? Can I clear any of them up? Now's the time. Both of threes and not this three and that three? Yeah. Um, what else would I, would I cancel? Just one of them? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just really confused right now. Okay. Let's look at a simpler example with just some numbers. Like, um, so. so this thing I'm going to write down is not derived from this problem. It's just 
pulling it out of the sky so that we can talk about it. Um, 20 over 15, we want to simplify this. We'll leave it as an improper fraction, okay? How does this simplify? What would this simplify to? Just throw it out there. Danielle? Four over three. Four over three. Okay, how'd you get that? Divide them both by five. Divide this by five, you get four, but divide that by five, you get three. Okay? So to start with, same thing here. Divide this one by three, cancel that that three, and you're left with just negative two, three plus five. Divide this one by three, this is three times two is six, right? So divide six by three, you're left with two. Okay? It's the exact same idea. We're just canceling out that common factor. Right? We could, um, to make this problem look a little more like that one, <coughs> Well, let's just erase it. Put a step in between here. We know we're going to wind up with 4 thirds. But that's just because 20 is 5 times 4. And 15 is 5 times 3. And just like I did up here, I'm going to cancel out these 5. 5 divided by 5 is 1. And so now we just have 1 times 4 thirds, and we're left with 4 thirds. Does that help? It makes more sense? It's OK if it doesn't, because then you have to say something else. Any other questions about this? Any other questions about the homework? Any part of the homework at all? Any shakes? Means no. Means we're good. Feel confident. We feel like experts. Okay, that's what you're telling me. Passing the homework then. Remember, top left of the page. Please. Pretty please. With sugar on top. Uh, let's, let's kind of continue uh, our discussion about this <coughs> somewhat true to life. We'll start with a little uh, trick. So um, you can write this down or you can do it in your head, but do it in your head, just make sure you do it right. All right so I just want you to pick a number, a positive number. All right, a positive number. Okay, so write it down or keep it in your hands. Probably have done stuff like this before. Okay, so then double that number and add 12 to that number. 12. So you took a number, you doubled it, you added 12. Now you got a new number, take half of that number. Okay. Now subtract your original number. thought of, and uh, what did you get? Seven. You got seven. Anybody else get seven? What did you get? Six. Got six. Six. Danielle, you got six? You got six. Uh, and the truth is you'll always get six, and it's not that amazing. 
are just taking advantage of arithmetic. And you can probably figure out I'm making you do some stuff, and then I'm kind of making you reverse that stuff. And I'm just toying with the numbers so that we do it in this bit of a, an order that's supposed to throw you off a little bit and you don't see it coming, right? So uh, let's do one example, OK? What did you fix there? What was your number? I picked 6 to begin with. Oh, OK. <laughs> well, yeah, let's pick a different number. Because that'll seem like a little bit of trickery. One? We did one. OK. Uh, one. OK, then we doubled it. Multiplied by two. That gave us two. Then we added 12. That gives us 14. We divided it by two. Divided that by two. We got seven. Then we subtracted what? The original number, which was one. And so we got six. What's a, we'll do one more. What's another number? Crazy. Who's going to say you pick the biggest number? Pick the largest number. Bigger than 10? John, what did you pick? Um, what? What number did you pick to start with? You didn't pick one? Yeah. 75. 75. Let's just do 10. What did you do? I did 220. OK, that's pretty big. I don't know why you didn't pick up. That's pretty big. Uh, 220, doubled it, got 440, added 12, got 452, took half of that, 226, what's that? Uh, is it 226? Yeah. Oh, okay. And then subtracted your original number, which was 220, and you got 6. So now let's use some algebra. Uh, letting, let, let's represent any choice that somebody might make with a letter. So what letter might we choose to represent that? Any common number in algebra? Oh, A or X. I heard A first, so let's go with A. A can represent maybe A for any number. Choose any number. Okay. Then we're going to represent, just through algebra and, and arithmetic, uh, what happened to this number, and we're going to see it simplifies back down to 6 every time. Okay. So what do we do first? What do we do first? What do we do to the number of the first step? Doubled it. Okay, so I represent that by 2 times the number, right? And then what do we do? Add 12. Okay, so we add 12 to that result. Okay, and then what do we do with that? We did what? We subtracted. I think we did something before we subtracted it. Yeah? We took half. Took half. Half of that. Okay, and then what did we do? Subtracted the original number, which was represented by what? Subtract A. <coughs> All right. What we're going to use is like the discussion we just had to show that this is going to have to come out to B6. Right. So here is an expression a lot like the one we just talked about on the quiz. Right? It's got a, a, a variable, a multiple, a, we're adding something to it, we're dividing the whole thing by uh, an integer. So what would be the simplified version of 2a plus 12 over 2? What do we say about this, this 2? Dividing by 2? Can you just divide this part 2 by 2? Two? 2a divided by 2 and that's it? Is that okay? Can we do that? No? Why not, Jada? What do we have to do? What would be correct? Um, I don't know. I just realized that you Because of the what? Like, because you have to. I don't know. You can't. That's all I know. Okay. Okay. Well, here's the, the simplest way I can put it. You have to divide everything by two, right? 
How many things are up here in the numerator? How many terms are there? Here's a term, and here's another term, separated by addition or subtraction. Okay? So 2a plus 12 is a, it's a number, and we're dividing that number by 2. If we wanted to divide it in this form, 2a plus 2, we need to divide this by 2 and this by 2. Half of this plus half of this. Okay? So that would be, what's half of 2a? 1a. What's half of 12? Okay, it's 6. Just want to make you say that out loud. And then we're done with that, and then we subtract a, and what's left? It's six, always six. A minus a is gonna be zero, and we're left with six. Okay? There's lots of tricks like this. We could, instead of adding 12, we could add 10, okay? If we did do that, if we did add 10 instead of 12, what number would we wind up with? change this 12 to a 10, so you do 2a, double your number, add 10, and I'll still make you divide by 2, when you subtract a, you get what? Five. And we get 5, right, because this divided by 2 would be a plus 5, a plus 5, and when we subtract a, we get 5. You could triple your number, and then add, well, probably a multiple of 3, because then you're going to need to be able to cancel this 3 out. Right? We can do 3a plus something. This something should be divisible by 3 because we're going to divide by 3 at the end. So that we get 1a right here. Right? So we should probably add like a 9. Right? Add 9. And then we subtract our original number. We get a plus 3. 9 divided by 3 is 3 minus a. And we wind up with 3. Kind of change the steps around. And you can see if we write it out this way algebraically, you can see how you can just ex just change the steps a little bit. You could triple the numbers. You could add something. What about uh, would you want to subtract instead of adding twelve? Would you want to subtract twelve? Anybody think of any problems that, that might cause? If they picked a number that was small enough, and you subtract both, you go to the negative, that causes issues with, uh, with what we're doing here. Okay? Because here, if you have a positive number and you subtract a, you're just moving to the left, you're, you know, you're getting close to zero. But if you're negative and you subtract a, you're actually moving to the left more, you're getting further away from zero. It kind of messes with our idea. That's why I made you pick a, a positive number and then I made sure to add. Um, okay, well, just a little number trick. So now we're in 2.7, which shouldn't take very long. We all have lots of experience, I think, with square roots. Who here would say they're familiar with square roots? Just two people? How many people, okay, how many people would say they're not familiar with square roots? Okay. People who are willing to raise their hand to people who have familiarity with square roots. <coughs> then I'll ask you what's the square root of 4? 2, okay, we all know that. Why is it the square root of 4? Because 2 times itself is 4. Put this little uh, triangle, upside down triangle of dots. That means because. Square root of 4 is 2 because 2 times itself is 4. So, what's the square root of A? The square root of some number A? Let me even say that. 
said the square root of a is b. So what do we know about b then? Does yeah, it times is uh, itself, yeah. times itself equals a. Very specifically, b squared is a. If if the square root of a is b, what that means is that b times itself is a. Okay, so that's the definition of a square root. All right. Um, let's see. So let's learn a little bit of vocab. This guy right here is called the radicand. It's called radicand because this guy right here, this symbol, is called the radical. The radical is, is just the symbol here, and the thing inside of the radical is called the radicand. Let's talk about, and we'll just put uh, some words to it. Uh, number, I'll say term, term inside the radical. What kind of numbers can we have as the radicand? What kind of numbers can we take the square root of? Or maybe what kind of numbers could we not take the square root of? about the definition of a, of a square root. If, uh, if we square b and it gets us a, then b is the square root of a. What kind of numbers can we take the square root of and what kind of numbers can we not take the square root of? Of odd numbers? Okay. So if I can find this, uh, an odd number that has a square root, <coughs> and that'll, that'll be a counter example. How about the square root of 9? It's 3. And lots of like 25 and uh, 81. A lot of odd squares. OK, so odds are OK. Evens, clearly. Uh, well, there's at least one that's OK. Does it have to be a whole number? That's a good question. Let's take a look at that. Um, how about the square root of 0.25? Okay. Now, the, the square root doesn't have to be a whole number either. It could be a decimal. But if we can find a decimal that multiplies by itself and gives you 0.25, then that's the square root. And notice that this is just 25 behind a decimal. So ideas for what could be the square root of 0.25? 0.5. If we do 0.5, 1 half times 0.5, another half, half times a half, it is 0.25. So those are okay. We could even do uh, a fraction. We could use the fraction 1 over 4. Or we could use the fraction 9 over 16. What would be the square root of 9 over 16? What can you multiply by itself to get 9 over 16? Three over four. Three over four times three over four. Nine over sixteen. Okay, that worked. Okay, so definitely whole numbers. There's whole numbers that have uh, square roots. Decimals have square roots. Fractions have square roots. Even a number like. Uh, 2. The square root of 2. I know the square root of 9 is 3 because 3 times 3 is 9. And, and we figure out these square roots pretty easily. Can you tell me what the square root of 2 is? If we could find the square root of 2, how would we know it was the square root of 2? How would we test it? number that we think is the square root of another number. The square root of 4 is 2 because 2 times 2 is 4. OK, 
Okay, so if we had the square root of 2, it would be the square root of 2 because? You square it and you get 2. If you square it, you get 2. But is there a, a nice number that you know of? 0.3 or something? Do you know what it is? Yes or no? You don't know. Okay. Um, and it turns out these kinds are, uh, we'll talk about them later, but this is not a perfect square. Or rather, I should say, 2 is not a perfect square. 9 is a perfect square because there's a, a, a rational, well, there's a, a whole number out there, uh, an integer, let's say, an integer that multiplies by itself to get 9. Okay? So perfect squares are 4, 9, 16, 25, all those guys that are 2 times 2, 2 times 3, 4 times 4, 5 times 5. Those are perfect squares. Okay? But it does have a square root. It's okay. There is some number out there like repeating or non-repeating infinite decimal as it is, there is a number that if you multiply it by itself would give you two. So there, there is a square root of two. Okay. Um, it's not a nice number, but it's out there. So what, what numbers don't have any square roots? You have to multiply a number by itself. What kind of number will you never get? Right? One. One, okay, think about one. If we want to know if there's a square root of one, we say, is there a number times itself that gives you one? One. One. One is actually its own square root. You multiply one by itself, you get one, so one's okay. Uh, decimals are okay. We talk about, I uh, gave you at least one uh, example. Okay, how about this? How about the square root of negative four? What's the square root of negative four? Anybody got a guess? Just throw a guess out there. Is it two? Why is it not two? Caleb? Okay. Jada, do you have another guess? I think it might be negative two. Okay, maybe negative two. Okay. And that's a reasonable guess. But we'll just remember that the square root of a number, if, if it exists, then multiply that number by itself and you should get the original number, right? So if this is true, then we're going to do what with negative 2? Multiply it by itself, its exact copy. What will we get? We get positive 4, Taylor. So then would it be positive negative um, So you saw this thing and wondering maybe what it means? So this, well, we'll talk about what this means, but it's, it actually represents two different numbers. The, what turns out here is that negative four doesn't have a square root, because there is a number that can multiply by itself to get you a negative number. There's no way to multiply a number by its copy and get a negative number. If you multiply a positive by a positive, you get positive. Negative times negative gives you also a positive. Those are our two options. So, square root of negative four, it's not possible. Can't take the square root of a, a negative number, okay? So, only um, positive real numbers, and is there another number besides positive numbers that has a square root? What numbers are not positive? You can't think of any numbers that aren't positive? Negative two. Negative two, okay. 
So can we classify like a big group of numbers that aren't positive? You just told us one of them. Numbers that are less than zero, negative numbers. Less than zero, those numbers are not positive. Is there another number that's not positive? Got positives, you got negatives. Nathan just highlighted the relationship that the negatives have. Is there another number that's not positive? Zero. Is it positive? Is it to the right of zero? No, is it negative? Is it to the left of zero? No, it is zero. They're Positive numbers are greater than zero, negative numbers are less than zero. Zero is neither of those, zero is its own thing. So um, this is, I already told this in my Algebra 2 class. So this is an R, the letter R with two vertical lines rather than just one, and that stands for all the real numbers. We've talked about real numbers before. But not all the real numbers, because negative numbers are real too. Okay, so we put a little plus here to mean all the positive ones, the positive real numbers that have so all those numbers have square roots. All have square roots. But negatives can't have square roots, so that's important. Okay, so let's talk about this, this thing here. What does this mean? Before you do that, let's just back up. Let's talk about square root of nine. Okay, what's the square root of nine? Why is it three? Because three times is something. Thank you, Sarah. I'm saying that loud, confidently. Okay, that's what I want from everyone. The square root of nine is three because three times itself is nine. Is there any other number that if you multiply it by itself, it'll also give you positive nine? Also, negative three would do that. Negative three times negative three also equals positive nine. So that must also be a square root of nine. So positive three and negative three are both square roots of nine. That's what that symbol means. It just means positive three and negative three are my answer. Positive and negative three. So every positive, right? So we'll talk about all positive numbers that have square roots uh, have two square roots. One of them is going to be positive, one of them is going to be negative. How many square roots does zero have? What's the square root of zero? What number times itself gives you zero? Zero. Positive and negative zero? Does that make sense? Is zero positive? We get the opposite of zero? No, there's, there's no positive or negative to zero. So zero is its own, is, let's say, even only square root. We just looked at that. There's no positive or negative. So um, we talked about this a second ago, but what's a perfect, what's an example of a perfect square? Anyone with the confidence of a Sarah, tell me an example of a perfect square. Get the ball rolling. Class relies heavily on you guys to participate. Caleb? Two times two is a perfect square. The number four is a perfect square. Let's get another one. Let's get three more. Four times four, 16. 16 is a perfect square. Six times six, who said six times two? That's right, 36 is a perfect square. And one more. What? Nine is a perfect square because three times three is nine. So a perfect square would be one where you can take two integers, multiply it by itself, right? One integer, multiply it by itself, and get that number. It's got to be an integer. An integer, an integer means it could be positive or negative uh, or zero, but it has to be a, like a whole number. I don't know a better way to say it. It can't be a part, part of a number. It's got to be an entire number. 
Okay. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, 0. These are integers. If you can multiply one integer by itself, what you get is a perfect square. Okay. So how about the square root of 37? Is that a perfect, is, is 37 a perfect square? Okay. But here's what I want us to be able to do. Can you guess what the square root of 37 is close to? Is close to six. To six. Right? How'd you know that, Zane? Because six times six is thirty-six. Six times six is thirty-six. Thirty-seven is just one away, so it's <laughs> close. Okay. Um, about square root of one forty-seven. What's that close to? Is the square root of one forty-seven close to? Is it twelve? Twelve. Twelve squared is. Twelve times twelve is one hundred forty. One hundred forty. 144, 147 is just three away from that, so it's close to 12. Okay? So this is close to 6, this is close to 12. We have some decimal parts to it, but uh, uh, it's close to 12. So if you, if you wanted to compare numbers uh, real quickly, if you had, uh, well, the square root of 147 and the number 12, which is larger? <laughs> Square root of 147 or 12, which is larger? Say? Square root of 147. Why? What's your reasoning behind that? Because there's a little bit more than 12. Yeah, you, 144 is 12 squared. 12 squared is 144. To get to 147, we need a little bit more than 12. Okay? Just to be squared. So like, it's like 12.16 or something. You square that, and you get 147. Okay. Turns out, though, it's not that easy. If you don't have a perfect square or like um, a fraction that's a perfect square over a perfect square, like we've had 9 over 16. Well, that's just a perfect square over a perfect square, so I could make a fraction that would, you know, I multiply it by itself straight across. I'm going to get 9 over 16. Or a decimal that's really just like a disguised perfect square, like 0.16, well, that's just 16. But, you know, uh, 1 one hundredth of 16. If we take 0.4 and multiply it by itself, we'll get 0.16. If we have something like 147, the square root of 147, the square root of 37, the square root of 2, the square root of 3, the square root of uh, 11, anything that we know is not a perfect square, well, or, or some like, version of the square. What we call these numbers, and these ones like this, um, they're, at, they're at least in the set of irrational numbers. They're not the only ones, right? So square roots of things that aren't perfect squares, they're irrational. Also, other numbers, such as uh, pi, sorts of other numbers that you don't need to know the specific definitions right now. But they exist and are not just simply the square root of some non-perfect square. Okay? They're called irrational. Right? So if you remember, uh, close to the first day of school, we pulled out this chart. Okay? We talked about this already. We talked about uh, natural or whole numbers. We talked about the integers, right, which contain the natural whole numbers. We talked about the rational numbers, okay, which we're going to include in this square root of perfect squares, square root of 4, square root of 16, square root of uh, 9, 16, this would be in there. But the square root of 2 and the square root of 3 and the square root of 7, the square root of any number that's not a perfect square, would be irrational. Okay? And here's what we'll find when we try to take the square root of something like 2, okay, once you grab a calculator, like this one, this one. Take the square root of square root of two. Okay, is that exactly right? No. Okay. To prove it to you, this isn't exactly the square root of two. I could just take one point four, one four, two one, three five six two, and square it. I get something really close to 2, okay, 
So, well, this is the answer he gave me, though. Why, why didn't that come out to be 2? Well, true is an irrational number. What does that mean about the answer he gave me? Yeah? They rounded it up. They rounded it. They rounded it up or they rounded it down, either way. Yeah. It's rounded. Uh, which means there's more numbers, right? More decimal places. Okay. How, <laughs> how far do you think this decimal goes? Take a guess. Forever. 100 digits or forever. It goes forever. Okay. Here we go. So, square root of 2 is 1 point. Let's bring that back up. 1 point, say, 4142. And it just keeps on going forever and ever and ever, forever. That's what those dots mean. Okay. And another thing about it, if, it, if we found out that, that after this string of 4142135622 was another string of 4142135622, and it just repeated, okay, well, that would be a rational number. We could write that as a rational number. But it turns out, in the whole string of all the decimals forever and ever, there's no consistent repeating pattern. It doesn't show up. Okay? So it goes forever, and this decimal doesn't repeat. Not to say that somewhere in there there's not some repeating like right next to each other, 1, 7, and then a 1, 7. But it doesn't keep going. That pattern doesn't continue forever. So if the decimal goes forever and it doesn't repeat, that's one way we know that it's not a rational number. It's an irrational number. Do you remember what we said is a rational number? What kind of a number is a rational number? I'm going to call on somebody. Let's just have that be, I suppose. Cameron, can you tell us what kind of a number a rational number is? Just write the word rational while you. Oh, rational, not irrational? Yeah, rational. Um, is it like fractions and like decimals and stuff? Fractions and decimals, that could be written as fractions. Oh, right. right? So, so all the numbers that are A over B, where A and B are integers. And we talked about integers a minute ago. That can be positive and negative versions of whole numbers and also zero. Okay. So some decimals can be written as fractions. An easy one is 0.25. What fraction is that? Yeah. One fourth. Even if a decimal goes forever but it repeats, like 0 0.165, 165, 165, 165, 165, we could uh, quickly find uh, a fraction that is equal to that repeating decimal. Okay. Like uh, a repeating decimal that we might know, 0 0.3333 3, 3 forever, what fraction is that equal to? One third. Okay. So a rational number is one that can be written as a fraction, so an irrational number would be one that can't be written as a fraction. Can't write it as a fraction. Um, so I'm going to throw a practice problem at you. I want you to look at number seven. No, sorry, four. That's uh, negative square root of 49. See if you can tell me what the negative square root of 49 is. Do about 10 seconds. Anybody disagree with negative seven? Probably not, since I just stood up here and said good. I don't want to disagree. It's just the nature of the What we have here is a negative number. It's a negative in front of the number. Right? So we can just like cover that up and think what's the square root of 49? Seven, and so we want to make that number negative, negative seven. Okay. Uh, 
and just don't confuse this with the square root of negative 49. It's a completely different thing. Here we want to find the square root of positive 49, which is 7. 7 times 7 will give you 49. And I'm going to put a negative to that number, negative 7. <coughs> but the square root of negative 49 doesn't exist because we can't multiply, number, multiply a number by its exact copy and get a negative number. So this doesn't exist. Right? That's very good. Very good. Um, okay. Well, that does it for 2.7. Uh, and we have time. So you may appreciate what I'm about to share with you, and you may not. Okay? And I hope that all of you appreciate it. If three of you appreciate it, if one of you appreciates it, then it's totally worth it to me. But, but I want to share uh, a story about my math journey. Right. So uh, <coughs> I was in high school. I didn't love math so much. Uh, I didn't do well in one of my math classes in, in middle school, and that kind of put me in a bad mood for the rest of the four years. So I did it, and I did okay in it, and, and I, I helped people from time to time. So. You know, I didn't, didn't struggle too hard, but uh, I didn't really see all the connections. I didn't really appreciate it. So then I went to college, and I took um, a couple of math classes. I felt a little intimidated. I took a couple of math classes, like probably something like an Algebra 2, and then maybe a Pre-Calculus. And then I got the Calculus, and I loved Calculus, and that reignited my love of math. And then uh, that was in uh, junior college in San Diego. Then I um, moved up here. And it had been a long time since I had taken a math class. Uh, yeah, like several years. And I was really intimidated to go back and take any math classes. But I, I, I did enjoy math, and I wanted to be a math uh, teacher. Because I had tutored at junior college and enjoyed that. So I took um, linear algebra, which sounded crazy. I didn't know what that was about. And so I was a little bit afraid of that. And I took um, uh, abstract math, right? I didn't really know what that meant. Um, so I took those two classes, and they sounded pretty crazy. And I took abstract math, and it was all about proofs. And not like proofs in geometry, which are, I'm not, well, you guys haven't taken geometry. Well, they're not my favorite, OK? But uh, they're about just, it was about proving things. It was about seeing math for its pure structure and proving things about numbers, OK? So let me tell you a story about Pythagoras, OK? Has anybody, has anybody ever heard of Pythagoras? One, two. Okay. Where? Why does that name sound familiar, Pythagoras? Sarah. Uh, the Pythagorean theorem. What does Pythagorean theorem say? Oh, oh. Yeah. oh I, you know what? I just. Yeah. Yeah. A squared plus B squared. A squared plus B squared. Okay. Well, it's not true in general, right? What is the context of that? Oh. Okay. Well, that's pretty good that you know that. Yes. What? What are A, B, and C? They relate to any like a shape of some kind? Theta? Happening under A? Same? They relate to a triangle. A triangle. What kind of a triangle? John? A right triangle. A right triangle. Here's a right triangle with a 90 degree angle. Okay. What does A represent? Let's go to C. What does C represent? Same? That side. That side, the yeah. long side, yeah, with a starts with an H. The hypotenuse, right? So that's C, and so this is A, and this is B. It doesn't matter which is A and which is B. It's all because I add them together. Adding is commutative. So if I square A and I square B, I'll get C. Okay, uh, C squared, and then I can take the square root of that number, and I have the length of that side. Well, here's an example: three, four, and five. So Pythagoras is, gets the credit for this theorem, though with any really ancient history, it's always disputed. So some people think that it was Chinese mathematicians came up with it, that, uh, or Egyptian before Pythagoras. Um, so if we look at this, we can see 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. Let's see if that's true. Does Pythagoras' uh, theorem hold up? We got 9 plus 16. That does equal 25. Yeah, it does work for this example. This is, if you did have triangle with three, four, and five sides, one of the angles would be uh, a 90 degree angle. So, yeah, this is true for all right triangles. Okay, so Pythagoras.
Pythagoras uh, at least understood this, and he really liked it a lot. So Pythagoras was the leader of a cult called the Pythagoreans. Okay? And they all believed that uh, numbers could explain all of the universe, particularly uh, rational numbers. Okay? Um, so they, they thought that in some way all things would relate together using rational numbers. Okay? So they come along this triangle here. This side's one, and this side is one. So how long is this side, if we use Pythagorean theory? Huh? It's C, where we could use C squared to find C. What's A? Oh, camera, you got it? Is it two? It's almost there. Here, let's, let's go this way. So what's A squared? One squared? Two, one, very good. Plus B squared, also one. Well, that equals C squared. Two, well, this one is two, equals C squared. So C squared equals two, what does C equal? Uh, 2 equals c squared. If you square c, you'll get 2. So what is c equal to? We square, we go all the way back to the definition of a square root. Right? If b squared equals a, then what's b? If I can square a number and get this other number, square a number and get this other number, then that's, that number right there is the square root of that other number. So what's c squared? Or sorry, what's c? c is take c, multiply it by itself, I get 2. So what do I call c in relationship to 2? Two times one does equal two, but C has to multiply by itself. It's just a definition. It's the square root of two, right? Whatever the square root of two is, C is it. The length of this side is the square root of two. So if you could find the square root of two, you would know how long C was, right? So we already talked about the square root of two. It's close to 1.4142, right, forever. But here's the thing that Pythagoreans believe. They have these whole numbers, one and one. They're in this triangle, right? A really like fundamental shape in the universe. And then this side is the square root of two. Clearly using Pythagorean's theorem, it has to be the square root of two. So since this side is one, a whole number, and this side is one, a whole number, they thought, we don't know it yet, what it is exactly, but the square root of two must also be a whole number divided by a whole number, a rational number. It's got to be got to be a rational number. If it wasn't, that would kind of mess things up for them. Okay? Are we all tracking along here? We've got, we got a triangle. One side's one, the other side's one. So the hypotenuse has got to be, maybe it's like 121 divided by 15 or something. <coughs> I don't know what it is exactly, but they were confident it had to be something. Okay? So back to my math story, my personal experience. Uh, the first proof I ever saw was that the square root of 2 can't be rational. There's no way to write it as one whole number over another whole number. Which seems like a big claim because maybe it's like two really huge numbers and it perfectly works out to the square root of 2 when you divide them. Right? And we just haven't found them yet. Right? Does that make sense? Maybe we just haven't explored big enough numbers to divide and get exactly the square root of 2. Right? So, this is a proof, and I'm going to try to simplify it down and just do it as, as basic as possible. Right. So let's say that the square root of 2 is a rational number. What does it mean to, that a number is rational? We just talked about it. What, what is a rational number? That's irrational. So if it's rational, you can't write it. So if the square root of 2 is rational, let's assume that square root of 2 is equal to some a, that's it, that looks like a b, 
some A over B. Okay. And let's assume that this is the, the simplest form of A over B. So A is something, maybe it's some huge number, and B is some other really huge number, and we divide them, we get the square root of 2 exactly. So what we're going to do is prove that you can't do this. Actually, what our assumption will turn out to be wrong. So if the square root of 2 uh, is rational, let's just start to mess around with this. Well, we'll square both sides. Okay. Well, if I square the square root of 2, that means I take the square root of 2 times the square root of 2. Well, the square root of 2 times the square root of 2, the square root of 2 times itself should give you 2. So that side is 2. If I square this side, that's a over b times a over b. That would be multiply straight across a squared over b squared. Okay. Then we'll multiply both sides by b squared. On this side, cancels out. So over here we have 2 times b squared equals a squared. Okay. So a and b, they're these, they're these whole numbers. Um, so 2 times a whole number is equal to a squared. What do we say about numbers that if 2 times some number equals this other number, right, this other number is divisible by 2, what do we call numbers that are divisible by 2? They have their own name. And it starts with an E. Numbers that are divisible by 2 are called what kind of numbers? Even numbers. Numbers that are divisible by 2 are even. So this would mean that a squared is even which would have to mean that A is also even. Okay. So if A squared is even, then A would have to be even. Um, because the only way to get an even number, an even numbered square, is to square an even number to start with. Okay. So A is also even. So if A is even, then what we're really saying is that A is equal to 2 times some other number. That's where an even number is. 2 times some other number k. So we could just replace a with 2k and square that. So uh, let's see. Yeah. 2b squared then equals 4k squared. <laughs> we multiply this by itself, we get 2 times 2 is 4, k times k is k squared. And we'll divide both sides by 2. So b squared equals 4 cancels with 2, 2k two squared. Well, the same reasoning applies here. 2 times b squared, 2 times b squared equals a squared, which meant that a squared was even, which meant a is, is even. Here we have b squared is equal to 2 times some other number, which means that b squared is even, which would have to imply that b is even. So both a and b are even. Okay. Is there a problem with a and b both being even? up here at A over B. What do we say about A over B? In simplest form. What does it mean if it's in the simplest form? Yeah. It can't be simplified. It can't be simplified, right? If we can't simplify a fraction, it means we can't cross out any common factors. But what we're saying here is that if this is true, then this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true. B and A and B are both even, which means they're both divisible by 2, which means A over B would have to be possible to simplify. We just cross out the 2's that they both have a factor of, and then simplify it down. Just half of A over half of B. But we, we assumed at the beginning that A over B was this, what's called irreducible fraction. We can't simplify it at all. We can't cancel out any common factors. We just proved that if the square root of 2 was rational, then a would have to be even, and B would have to be even. Right? It's like this never-ending cycle. If I assume this, then something that's contradictory to my assumption has to be true. So I can't have something contradictory to my truth. So what has to be true is that my assumption at the beginning can't be. 
you can't write the square root of 2 as a over b with a and b being whole numbers. Okay. So the square root of 2 is therefore irrational. So when I read that, I thought that's amazing because at first, before the proof was written down, I thought, how can you know for sure? Because you, you can't exhaust all your options. We haven't gone through all the, the big, big, big numbers that are just unimaginably huge and then divide it by some other unimaginably huge number and know that there's no way that, that some big number or some other big number is equal to the square root of 2. But by this, there's no way. It cannot be one whole number over another. Okay? So the fact that you could show something like that without having to test all of your options, that was really cool to me. I thought that was amazing. Um, and that's, that was within the first week or so of that, that abstract math class. And uh, it just really made me hungry for more. I wanted to read more and more and more about it. I wanted to write those proofs myself. Um, and the, the interesting thing about this is a story that went along with this in the book. Um, so we go back to Pythagoras. And this triangle, and remember they thought, well, here's this triangle that has a whole number and a whole number as sides. So the hypotenuse must also be the relationship of two whole numbers. But we just showed that it can't be. It can't be a rational number. It can't be one whole number divided by another whole number. So a couple of things. This is all, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but it's widely believed that somebody in the Pythagoreans, the cult that was led by Pythagoras, uh, proved this like kind of to himself, right? He's just working it out. He's hanging out. He's, you know, working out this proof, trying to show that it could be rational. Um, and figures out that it, it's impossible that it could be. This troubles him so much. This could be true or maybe not. That he throws himself off the, the deck of the ship that he's on and drowns himself because he's just so distraught that this could be. Like, it destroys his entire universe. He thought that this had to be rational. It turns out it can't be rational. Huh? Yeah, he's so distraught. It's like, it was really, really sad for him. On top of that, the Pythagoreans are very secretive, and uh, they didn't write anything down. They, they kept everything buried within their own group. And so uh, it, it's rumored that eventually, you know, all the Pythagoreans learned about this truth, and it's like, it's like one of their main things is, is something like this it has to be a rational number. So when they find out that it can't be, and then somebody spills the beans to somebody outside the Pythagoreans. They take a boat. I don't know why there's always boats involved. They take this boat out to uh, a deserted island. And they leave him there. They strand him there to, uh, well, to die, I suppose. Because they were so, it destroys their entire belief system. So uh, the square root of two being irrational, two untimely deaths coming out of that, kind of crazy. But just the fact that you can show something like this beyond a doubt. It just is. It just has to be true. Um, that's what I liked about math. It was just absolutely true. You can't argue with that. Even though know they're just numbers and they may not mean anything specific, we can't know these things for sure. And once it's proven, you can't unprove it. Even in science, sometimes things will be accepted as true. Yeah, this is definitely the way it works. Like an atom is it. It is the smallest thing. And then they figure out there's a lot of tiny things that make up atoms. Not only that, protons and electrons, there's even smaller things that make up those things. And we're going to just keep going and breaking those things apart and figure it out. We don't know what we think we know. But this, we'll always know this. And this will never be not true. And maybe that's just my personality type. This maybe my brain works. I like absolute truth. Uh, but I think if you want to debate me on this, I'd love to, but I can't think of any other subject where there's an absolute truth. Like, this is definitely true always on Neptune, on Mars, in this culture, in that culture, for this, you know, human being, for this one cell of me, but it's just true. It is true. Yeah. What? I don't know. I, I guess it could be possible. Is that troubling? 